Um, okay, so good morning and good evening to everyone, wherever you are. So for those who don't know me, I'm Christina Rocha, I'm Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Religion and Society Research Cluster at Western Sydney University, but I'm also part of the ARC Spirituality, Wellbeing and Risks team. So I, it's a pleasure to chair this session of our symposium. And although I'm not presently in Australia, I still want to begin by acknowledging the Darug people of the Yura Nation, traditional custodians of the land in which I am, I usually live, and pay my respects to their indigenous elders, past and present. And I extend that ex respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. And I also wanted to be a Big cheeky and um, also um, acknowledge the uh, Greek my, um, diaspora. I'm in Greece at the moment and uh, the Greek diaspora all over the world and how um, much they worked to make Australia home. And um, we have large communities in Melbourne and in Sydney where I live. So some housekeeping first, as we have done before, the presentations are 20 minutes or less. There will be time for questions at the end of the panel when everybody has presented and the questions can be either um, asked on the chat or orally you just raise your hand. Um, we are recording as you can see and this will all be shared later on the SWELL website. So our first presenter is a pleasure to present um, to introduce Linda Woodhead who is the F.D. Morris Chair and Head of Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College in London. And she researches religion, spirituality, and values in post-Christian societies. So Linda, thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours and I'll mute myself now. Thank you very much, Christina. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you, whatever time zone you're in. Let me just uh, share my presentation. Is that okay? You can see. Um, yes. Great. Okay. Um, I'll just use the slides like that. This is um, um, this um, um, invitation um, gave me an opportunity to talk about uh, abuse, particularly, but not exclusively sexual abuse. Uh, I'm currently part of an AHRC funded project run by Gordon Lynch and I'm working on a part of it with Joe Kind, and we are interviewing long-term survivors of sexual abuse in religious and spiritual contexts. It's still quite early days. We've done about 30 interviews and we've reviewed uh, a lot of the national inquiries, including the uh, Royal Commission in Australia. And that's the basis, that's the data I'm going to be drawing on. I'm not gonna be quoting directly, but I'm gonna be drawing on it and what I'm going to say. So this, um, this uh, event made me think about the question of whether spirituality is as prone to um, abuse, uh, whether it's as, as, um, as good an environment for the abuser, if you like, as religion. We tend to think of more high demand, tightly bounded, hierarchical authority, that kind of religion as the most dangerous context, the most likely to harbor abuse. But is that true? Well, we don't have enough quantitative evidence to answer that. So well, the way I want to approach it is to look at uh, what makes a religious or spiritual group um, a safe haven for a perpetrator and to see what if it's more likely to happen in spirituality. I'm not going to start by defining spirituality. That's something we can come back to. Let me start by saying that in the most common setting for sexual abuse and child abuse, as you know, is the family. Families are very dangerous places. Um, we also know that um, industrial schools, uh, children's homes, those sorts of institutions have had very high levels of abuse. Now, there's a very obvious reason why families and children's homes are dangerous places, and, and that's because perpetrators, their children are actually trapped in those. You know, there's, there's nowhere they can go. So they are extremely dangerous places if you're trapped there with a perpetrator. But most religions and spirituality is not as dangerous in the sense that you're, you can leave much more easily. You're not trapped there. You're not as dependent there, generally speaking. <clears throat> and so perpetrators 
in religious groups in the broad sense, I'm going to use religion there, uh, have to work in a more subtle way. They have to be more stealthy. They have to prepare for longer to abuse someone and they have to use the organization and the institution to support them in their abuse. And they have to be more calculated and crafty. And it's that kind of abuse that I, I will be looking at now. I want to divide the talk into two headings. I want to look at the weapons of the perpetrator of abuse and the armor. So two very simple headings, the weapons and the armor. <clears throat> so starting with the weapons a perpetrator um, can use and build, sharpen in a religious or spiritual context. The first one is to use the authority that the group confers as a weapon for abuse. If you are scared of a leader, if you recognize their authority voluntarily, or if you are charmed by them, if they're highly charismatic, if you worship them, people sometimes say, I, I really worshiped him uh, before the abuse happened. That is often a weapon that can be used, can be turned to abusive purposes. Abusers can be quite charismatic, quite shiny. They may have genuinely admirable traits and achievements, but they make a lot of them. Charming is a good word. The aim is to enchant you. And so there's seduction, not just coercion in this kind of abuse. There's a game in, in which the, the perpetrator, uh, everyone involved is getting something out of it. Um, but, you know, that's used to make victims feel complicit. Second weapon is to deploy sacred objects and symbols to cite scriptures. Um, we, you know, we shouldn't, this is something we shouldn't talk about. God demands this. One of our informants uh, was told when somebody wanted, in this case, actually, um, uh, this was same sex, uh, where somebody wanted to have a sexual relationship with them, an abuser, they were told God wouldn't want you to be frigid. Imagine what that does with your mind. So God doesn't want you to be frigid. Uh, so you can deploy the sacred in order to abuse. Demon possession is something that has been looked at, how that can be deployed as well. Um, and uh, even something like Buddhist meditation, we've come across examples where that is used for purposes of abuse. Third weapon. Abuse, perpetrators make abuse seem quite normal. It doesn't, it, they don't, unlike in, a, in, a, in other settings, they don't tend to jump on you. In, in industrial schools in Ireland, in the report, I mean, some perpetrators would literally jump on the children and rape them. Uh, in religious and spiritual settings, it's often it's a normalization. They spend time with the victim. They build a relationship. They start often with gentle touch, which, which, which is part of the spiritual practice some kind of touching. So it could be a healing touch. Uh, it could be a massage. It could be a blessing. And so it seems normal to touch. They break down boundaries. And that's my fourth weapon. It, in the, every case we've been talking to people, there's a blurring of the boundaries between me and you. The abuser gets into your private space. They do things like, oh, let's just share a hotel room. It would be cheaper. Or um, the car is often a, a, a setting in which, you know, hands creep and things move in that tight, confined space. Bathrooms, you know, places where boundaries can become very blurred. Touching, I've mentioned, um, uh, we heard an example in our interviews of where um, in Buddhist meditation practice, this was Tibetan Buddhist meditation practice, where in a, in a Western uh, Tibetan Buddhist group, where the practice of loving compassion is to empathetically enter into the consciousness of another person. That was abused to enter into that person's psyche. Confession can be abused like that. Talk about the group as a family can be abused like that. All blur the boundaries. So there are four weapons, um, but it's not just weapons that that uh, are conducive to abuse. Institution, religious institutions, spiritual groups, organizations uh, can also offer protection. They can offer a kind of armor to somebody who wants to perpetrate. <clears throat> How? 
here are some of the ways we've discovered. Um, first of all, in some, they are literally being paid. You know, if they're in a, if they're in a, a salaried uh, clerical role, they are being paid to be in that role. They're being paid to perpetrate, to put it very crudely. Uh, secondly, they can use the religious or spiritual authority and prestige and legitimacy to cultivate friends in high places. That's often done sort of in preparation, so that if they are ever discovered, often in these cases, quite prominent people in society will be wheeled out to say, to give a character reference, to say, oh, it couldn't possibly be, this is such a good person. Um, thirdly, um, perpetrators often implicate others. They sometimes kind of flaunt their abusive control to selected people. They kind of hide in plain sight. They drop hints. They might brag about a victim in front of a third party. Um, there's a little bit of informing others what you're doing just a tiny bit so that they can then say, oh, but I told you about this. But they don't kind of tell you quite enough to be able to um, really focus on it, but there's an there's a, there's a implication in a, of other people. Fourthly, um, as we know now um, from Jennifer Freyd's work and her little acronym of DAVO, of how perpetrators, when they're discovered, behave, they often discredit their accuser. They turn victim themselves. They say they're the victim being persecuted here, and they actively discredit their accusers Donald Trump is her great example of, of someone who's very good at that technique. Turn it against you. And that's not just after they've discovered though. They will often use gossip innuendo to sow suggestions about victims being a bit wobbly, a bit unreliable before the abuse or before the abuse is, is discovered. They might whisper bad things about somebody. Can't tell any details, but uh, you know, I do know a few things about that person, their victim. Fifthly, fog of confusion, uh, you can call it gaslighting. Um, there's a kind of cloak of fogginess, not quite Harry Potter's invisibility cloak, but fogginess, confusion around what's going on here. Perpetrators often use slippery talk. They're hard to pin down. They often slip through the net by throwing up smoke screens. Lots of different techniques. I won't go through lots of the ones we've heard about, but they include things like producing huge amount of material and confusing evidence very forensic you know if they're accused they'll produce so much evidence of their innocence that people get exhausted um, they will admit to some things but not the real crimes sort of throwing people off the scent they'll talk about mitigating things that they're really trying to help the victim or that the victim was wanting and asking for this and of course they'll use gaslighting on victims till they don't know what's real and what's not raising someone up, pulling them down the next moment and so on. And then finally, denial and dissociation. Um, they may be denying, a perpetrator may be denying to themselves or splitting off the perpetrating part from the good part. And groups and organizations also deny what's going on in front of their eyes. More research needs to be done on how and why people don't see the bad things that are happening. Some of research was done on that around the Holocaust and bystanding, but um, not so much has been done in relation to religious abuse. So um, to pull it together, um, is spirituality more, are, is, are, is spirituality um, more prone to harbor abusers than religion? Well, um, I don't think it's very hard to generalize about that. There are certain things in, in typical spirituality that do seem to be a bit of a safeguard. When there's a lot of focus on your own personal authority and authority is dispersed across the group rather than very hierarchically concentrated in one or two individuals, that is probably a safety factor. When leaders present themselves not as authorities, but as facilitators, as they often do in, in more um, uh, amorphous kinds of spirituality, that's probably uh, less conducive to abuse. When there's less purely male authority, as is typical in spirituality, again, a safety factor because 95% of perpetrators are male. And when there's easy exit from a group, 
A lot of people say in, in research with, I've done my career in spirituality, they say, well, I like this because I can try it out. And if I don't like the person or the leader or I give me the creeps, I just leave. And that, of course, can be a safety factor, too. But nevertheless, I think it is a misconception to think that only high demand cults are the dangerous ones. Uh, that's certainly not what we're finding. Abuse can happen in any setting and it can be lastingly damaging in other settings. People often think because if you if you are abused in, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you, you are then and you and you talk about it, you are then shunned. You lose everything. You lose the group. You lose your family. You lose might lose your livelihood. That that is particularly uh, appalling um, thing to happen to somebody. It is, of course. But we've been surprised at hearing from people who were abused in other more mainstream kinds of religion and spirituality about the lasting damage, uh, partly because they feel they shouldn't have been fooled. Or one who was abused in the Church of England, which, as you know, is, you know, particularly when she was young, is the most sort of respectable mainstream church in Britain, felt that it was like the whole of society had betrayed her because of the status that church had. And my final point is none of the, we should always look at this holistically. There are multiple factors in abuse. No one is abused if there are places they can go to have difficult conversations, whether that's school, whether that's family. When there is abuse, and we find this in all our interviews, there is sort of systemic failure. There was something in the family that meant they couldn't talk to somebody. The school didn't deal with it. Uh, as well as the religion. You know, it's a whole picture I put, it takes, it takes a village to abuse a child as well as to raise a child. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Linda. That was really exciting um, because so many people now are researching abuse in religious settings and new religious movements and in spirituality. So that was really good opening for us to discuss later on. <clears throat> so our next speaker is David Neuheiser, and I hope I'm saying his name correctly. He's a senior research fellow in the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University and an affiliate to the Gender and Women's History Research. His research explores the role of religious traditions in debates over ethics, politics, and culture. So thank you very much, David. The floor is yours. Thanks, Christina. And, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I am currently in Scotland in uh, at St. Andrews for the European Academy of Religion. And unfortunately, the conference is scheduled uh, for me to deliver a paper just after I do this one. So I won't be able to stay until the end of the session, I'm sorry to say, but I am really interested in being part of this conversation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the video back and um, hearing how the conversation develops. So can you all see my slides there? That I've shared. Okay. Yeah. And I sound okay. Great. All good. So, uh, so yeah. So, as Christina said, I'm a senior research fellow uh, at ACU and in the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry. My background is, I guess you could say, a, as a scholar of modern religious thought. A lot of the work that I do is trying to reanimate questions around religion for secular societies to show that because religious traditions have shaped the places that I've called home, Australia, the, the US, and the UK that in order to understand political conflicts that we have today, it's, it's essential to understand the religious background to them. And that these religious traditions have really, really rich uh, resources to offer if, if people want to try to think through the ethical and political challenges that we face. Anyone can draw on religious traditions regardless, regardless of their own identification. So that's sort of the, the, broad, um, the broad motivation for my work. I thought I would take the prompt for this conference as, a, as an opportunity to try to think about the relationship between those themes that I've been thinking about for a while and the, um, the theme of spirituality, because spirituality isn't a word that I often use for my work. I, as I've just said, I usually think instead about the ethical and political significance of religious and non-religious traditions. But as I thought about it, I realized that my work can be described as an attempt to think about the link between diverse spiritual practices and human flourishing. I think that's what's at stake in my interest in ethics and politics and the conflicted questions we face today. 
So I'm interested to see whether you all agree. Um, and with, with that conversation in mind, I, I wanted to, to talk to you about a project that I've been involved with recently about art. But by way of background, I'll just walk you through briefly uh, two other points of reference. So my first book, which is about hope, and then a collection that I've edited on atheism that recently came out, because for me, those are, those are the, the context that informs my, my interest in this art piece uh, that's just emerging. So my first book uh, came out a few years ago, uh, just at, uh, at the start, almost exactly the time when COVID began spreading around the world, my book on hope appeared. I think it's a coincidence, but uh, it seems like a slightly weird one. Um, and the, the sort of main thing that I'm doing in this book is to, is to think about what the, um, how hope enables people to sustain commitments, whether there's, those commitments are personal commitments, political or religious. I think hope is a spiritual practice that's necessary to sustain commitment of every kind. Uh, so I'm responding in part to critics of hope, like Karl Marx, Albert Camus, there are many others who worry that hope is, has a kind of pacifying effect, especially with respect to politics, insofar as, in their view, hope promises that everything will work out in the end. This is a, a, an important critique of religious hope in particular. So what I try to do in the book is to argue that, uh, to just develop an idea of hope as inflected by negativity. So on this view, hope doesn't have anything to do with optimism, but actually in my view, hope is consistent. It can incorporate a profound pessimism. And it's this kind of hope, which is a kind of extra rational discipline or spiritual practice that enables persistence in the face of uncertainty. So um, unusually in order to develop this idea of hope, I drew on two thinkers who are famously negative. They're not often thought to be thinkers of hope. So one is the medieval mystical theologian, Dionysius the Areopagite is enormously influential on medieval theology in both the East and West. Um, and then on the other hand, the deconstructive philosopher Jacques Derrida, who often called himself an atheist of a certain kind. He is the father of deconstruction, sort of paradigmatically postmodern thinker. So I was interested to think about hope in conversation with these two thinkers because they're really different in a lot of ways. But I think that difference makes their affinity more striking because in my view, I think they both describe practices of negativity, sort of spiritual disciplines of self-critique that aim to open up the future. So in their view, the sort of negativity isn't just, isn't just negative, but actually it opens up um, generative possibilities, opens up a kind of um, affirmation that doesn't claim to be certain, but, uh, but that, yeah, per persists through what I understand it as hope. One of the reasons I'm invested in this idea of hope as it develops through these, as I develop it through these thinkers is I think it's really important to acknowledge human vulnerability. I think uh, there's reason to suggest that right wing populist movements today are motivated to a large extent by the perceived loss of cultural dominance. And I think there's an anxiety there that's obviously really destructive, but it's understandable because I think in other domains, theologically, politically, this sort of sense of vulnerability, uh, it, can, it can cause people to, to respond in a way that's quite volatile. So as I understand it, hope offers a way to acknowledge this vulnerability and practice a kind of resilience in, in response to it. So rather than, rather than displacing it or denying it, I think hope lets us admit that, that the things that we assume, the things that we're familiar with might be misguided, institutions that we're part of, they might be unjust, they might require reform. And so for this reason, I think hope has a kind of affinity with, with um, protest movements that are trying to work for a more just world, whether it's in the context of labor organizing or racial justice or, or other things. I, I've come to, come to see these movements, which I've, I've um, found really moving over the last few years, especially. Um, I've come to see them as, as exemplifying the kind of thing that I care about, the kind of thing that I'm describing as, as hope, a sort of resilience in the face of vulnerability. So just one final point about this book, just to make it explicit, since it's important for the rest of my work. In my understanding, hope is a spiritual practice that cuts across the distinction between the secular and the religious. So that's one of the reasons why I was interested to develop this understanding of hope in conversation with this influential medieval theologian and this atheist French philosopher, is that I think it's certainly important in lots of ways that they don't affirm the same commitments. They have, they have very different views about, about the world and about God um, and everything else. Um, but I think
think that they, they still have this formal affinity. I think they share a hope that's identical in kind, even if the content of their hope isn't the same. And I think that I think that noticing that hope is a point of contact between the secular and the religious, it can help us to see that that, that boundary is blurrier than many people assume. And I think in the book, uh, one of the main things I do is to try to bring this understanding of hope as something that's shared between secular and religious communities, to bring it to debates about political secularization, about the role of religion in the public life of secular democracies, and to think about uh, these questions around populism that have preoccupied me lately. How can thinking at the intersection of the secular and religious, how can that help us gain some sort of leverage uh, against the, the challenges, really profound challenges that democracy faces today? So uh, the, the second point of reference I wanted to share with you is this collection that just came out, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press, Varieties of Atheism. So that came out of a uh, research project that I led from 2016 to 2019 uh, on the topic of, of atheism. And the main aim of, aim of that project was to try to explore possibilities for conversation between religious and non-religious traditions, because there's um, a really vigorous discussion around atheism today that's associated with the new atheists, for instance. Um, and there are public athe atheists that have opened up possibilities for um, for identity in life that many people find really helpful. Um, but there's the discussion ar around atheism, both in public, but also in the academy, tends to be pretty polarized. So both the sort of representatives of atheism and, and the sort of opponents of atheism who are trying to, trying to uh, offer an apology on behalf of some sort of religious faith, usually some version of Christian faith, they tend to define theism and atheism as if they're hypotheses about the world that are incompatible. So on this view, the thing that's central to both the theism and atheism is belief. It's a belief about whether a divine being or beings exist. And uh, yeah, I, I think that I think that this this is one of the reasons that the debate can become polarized, because if it's about sort of claims that can be stated um, squarely, I believe in a God or not, then it's easy to see that that, that sort of creates a situation where belief and unbelief can just be sort of squarely opposed. But one of the things that we were exploring in this project, and it's really what this book is about, is that scholars of religion have shown that religion isn't only, or maybe not even mainly a question of belief, but you know, attending to lived religion material practice is, is essential to understand what, what religious traditions actually consist in. And the same is true, in my view, for atheism. So atheism is flattened, I think, when it's made into a sort of abstract belief or unbelief. Um, but actually, atheism is much more varied and much more vibrant than, than this acknowledges. So the thing that I do, my con contribution to the book, gives a sort of uh, brief genealogy of atheism to try to sort of reframe this conversation in a sort of I don't know, Foucauldian mode, trying to show that the, the way that we've, uh, the received way in which we think about atheism, non-religion, uh, isn't the only way that it emerged, you know, over a particular history, we can think about it differently. So one, I think, useful point of reference is just to think about where the term comes from. So the, our English term atheist derives from the Greek atheos, which applies the negative prefix, the alpha, to the word for God, which is theos. And I think there's a clue in the construction of the term, because this suggests that the, the significance of the term atheist will shift depending on the particular theos to which it's opposed. So atheism has this kind of tension within it, this oppositional relationship to, uh, to theos or God. But there are many different ways of understanding God or gods. And so the significance of atheism shifts in that way. In Greek antiquity, the term generally applied to people who were seen as godless because they lived as if there were no divine laws. So. Um, the philosopher Socrates was famously accused and then executed of atheism in this sense. Socrates believed in a god of some kind, but Socrates just didn't, didn't live according to the contemporary standards of piety in his society. And so, yeah, he was seen as an atheist, even though he had a sort of belief in God. In similar fashion, in, in the first few centuries of Christian history, Romans considered early Christians to be atheist because Christians believed in God, but they they didn't they didn't adhere to the sort of poly polytheistic piety that was current at the time. And so yeah, they were also seen as being um, atheists in this in this sense. In uh, 
later European history, sort of through the Middle Ages, it's not only sort of members of one tradition that will call another tradition atheist, it, it's also something that Christians would call each other. So um, the term atheist migrates from Greek to the European languages in the 16th century. And in this period, it's, it's very frequently used by Protestant and Catholic Christians to accuse each other of godlessness. So um, there's a famous Catholic apologist in the 17th century, Francois Garras, attributes atheism to lots and lots of people, including ancient philosophers like Epicurus and Diogenes, biblical figures like Nimrod and Cain, and Garras's Protestant uh, opponents, John Calvin, Martin Luther, who Garras refers to as a perfect atheist. So on this, on this view, uh, Garras actually thinks that it's not possible for a person to, to, to not believe in God. He thinks the existence of God is so obvious. But these people are atheist in his view because they, they displayed what he saw as a godlessness that was mainly moral. So I think this sort of quick history suggests that, that where some people present the conflict between unbelief and credulity as if it's, if it's perennial, always the same, the significance of, of uh, atheism shifts over time. And one of the central pivot points becomes in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, there's a sort of effective anxiety that begins to color Christian faith. And as historians like Alec Ryrie have argued that, that becomes the sort of, um, I don't know, thin end of the wedge, whereby uh, and later in the modern period, some people will be able to claim atheism as, as an identity. The significance of atheism shifts when with uh, Diderot and Dolbach, uh, people can, can identify themselves as atheist. But it's partly because of, of uh, conceptual, but also effective trends that are, that are developing in, in uh, contemporary Christianity. Excuse me. So just to just to sum up in relation to the varieties of atheism. So the, the point of the book is, is that defining atheism narrowly in terms of belief makes it into an abstraction that fails to really get at what's going on, both in traditions of atheism as they actually exist, but also in religious traditions. It distorts the conversation. Um, and so if, if you look at the history of atheism, as this book does in relation to a range of themes, I think it's possible to see that atheism has encompassed ethical commitment, uh, political aims, emotion. So alongside propositional, cognitive thinking, modern atheism is motivated by a network of affects and attitudes, anxiety, anger, defiance, delight, skepticism, sympathy, and lots of other, um, lots of other affects. So it's not just about the sort of calm rationality of, of, of science, but that there's, uh, there's something more, more diverse and more interesting that's going on here. And that recognizing that makes it possible to see that there are much more complicated connections between particular forms of atheism and the particular religious traditions that they're in relation to, because there's always a sort of complex relationship of affinity and tension between them. Um, so I think it's a really exciting book. I'm super excited it's out. The main thing I wanted to, to underline uh, for our purposes today is that I think this underlines that it's important to think about spirituality as something that's not just for the religious, but that it's really central to non-religious identities as well. So the final thing I wanted to share with you is this project on art that I, that I promised. Um, so just to underline, so this, this is a, a, a project that I lead alongside my ACU colleague, Lexi Eichelboom, so that the ideas, the things that we've done, uh, they're, they're things that we've worked out together. Our collaboration has been really, really important. Um, so they're not just my ideas, but they, they speak to some of the things that have been developed in, the, in my work for a while. Um, so we, uh, we've been running for the last two years. We have funding from the Templeton Religion Trust. And the, the main aim of the grant is to think about how secular art, which is to say artwork that doesn't, doesn't um, have any thematic content that's identifiably religious, how it can, can offer a kind of spiritual understanding um, that may be similar to, to the understanding that's produced by religious ritual. So um, I guess in brief, the idea is to reframe the debate about art and religion and spirituality by bracketing the question of content, sort of setting aside whether the artists are working with religious symbols or whether they're sort of intentionally gesturing in that direction. And, uh, 
and instead think about practice just as practice is really formative for religious traditions. Uh, how can the how can the techniques developed in the field of ritual studies and the in the um, in religious studies? How can that help us to see something about this art art practices that we might miss otherwise? So uh, this slide here is is an image um, from the the gallery exhibit that was associated with the project. We over about two years we've been collaborating with a group of artists based in Melbourne. And we had um, gathered together an interdisciplinary working group of uh, scholars of, um, you know, religion, philosophy, theology, sociology, literature. And our group of, of scholars would go to the studio of an artist. So one at a time, we'd go every couple of weeks, we'd go to a different one, spend two hours just thinking in a really focused way on what the artist's doing, what are their practices, uh, what and, and can the category of ritual help us to see something about what's going on, the way in which those practices are enabling certain sorts of understanding that can't be sort of reduced to the um, to language, it can't be captured in language, but it's a kind of understanding nonetheless. And uh, so the thing that Lexi and I are working on at the moment is sort of gathering, gathering that work together in this edited collection, Secular Art and Spiritual Practice, which we're sort of finalizing at the moment. And uh, I've given you here the sort of uh, just a glance at the core set of chapters. So uh, in each of them, uh, the second in each pair is a member from this working group that I mentioned. So these are people that have been thinking about these particular Melbourne, um, Melbourne based artists in a really focused way. The first in each pair is a scholar of religion who is is bringing the, the scholarship on, on ritual studies into conversation with with uh, with the chapters on on uh, oh excuse me on uh, on art um, I'll stop sharing now okay so just to tie together some threads really quickly because I think I've come to time um, the thing that really excites me about this project is I think I have had the sense for a while that art is one of the places where spirituality happens for people who who are sort of alienated distant from religious traditions. And one of the things we've we found in the project, which I found really, yeah, really energizing, is the way in which uh, these, but both for viewers of art, but also for artists themselves, art has the capacity to sort of break open experience. It uh, we're, we have alongside this humanistic study that I've described, we have an empirical study that's part of the project. Some ex experimental psychologists have been studying the way in which seeing a dance performance can uh, promote feelings of awe or self-transcendence that are similar to those produced by a religious ritual. And so this is something I've sort of just begun, partly uh, with Lexi's help, because she's she's thought a lot in this area. I've just begun to think about art as a site of, of secular spirituality. But um, I find it really exciting. I'm happy to have the chance to share it with you all. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a very exciting paper. And it's good to know more about your trajectory and your research. So that was very good. Um, and I'm sorry you can't stay. So we will get uh, some questions for you later on. And if um, people want to write to David, feel welcome and um, um, with questions. But we'll move on to the next speaker now. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Anna Fedeli who is a senior researcher at the Philosophical and Theological College of Brixen in Italy. Her research focuses on lived religion, spirituality, gender, and corporeality, with a particular interest in ritual creativity and pilgrimage. So thank you, Anna. Um, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. I would like to thank um, uh, Anna Halalov, as well as the other members of the Swell uh, Research Network for inviting me to this uh, symposium. And um, well, during uh, the last, um, say, 20 years, I have been doing research on uh, neo-paganism and spirituality in Southern European countries, where um, the presence of uh, Catholicism is uh, still very strong. 
So I have been investigating a lot of the entanglements between spirituality and um, Catholic uh, religion. And um, this, um, this symposium has given me the, the possibility of reflecting um, in, in more detail about uh, the idea of risk specifically that is, uh, is uh, uh, very present in my, my latest research that I'm doing here in South Tyrol, Italy, where I live um, now. Um, first, I, I will give you a, 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 an overview of my trajectory because um, not all of you, of course, know me. Um, I, I, have, um, I have always been using in my research what is called a lived religion approach and what I also like to call a lived spirituality approach in the sense that I, I wanted to, to know how people really use religion, adapt it, and uh, what, they, what they actually consider as religion, what they consider as spirituality, and challenging a bit also these two terms, not taking for granted was what people were telling me, but trying to understand what for each person meant religion and what they meant with the spirituality. Um, I had uh, um, I, always, I have always held the research positions. Uh, these uh, positions were precarious. However, they gave me the freedom and great privilege of doing long-term ethnographic fieldwork for all of my research projects. This means that I have been doing ethnographic fieldwork for at least one year or more for each project I, um, I did. And um, it is my conviction that in, or, in order to understand spirituality well, and especially in order to understand what people mean when they say I am uh, spiritual but not religious, uh, it is important to spend time with them and uh, to be able, if possible, to develop a relationship of, uh, of trust with them. Because if they have to to discuss things such as abuse or, or, or feelings of risk and, and unsafety, they of course need to feel as well that they are in a safe environment and that they can uh, trust you. Um, also, I think it is important um, to follow the perceptions and the lived uh, spirituality of people for um, a longer period and if possible to um, to do um, what I call layered um, life stories, which are life stories that are based not only on formal interviews, but also on informal interviews done on several occasions and possibly also on follow-up interviews that are done um, once the, the official fieldwork period, the official research period is over, to check back with people and see what has uh, changed in their spirituality, what has changed in, in their life, and if maybe there have been some major, major changes. No? Um, so I developed this, this technique of layered life stories because when I started to do research on alternative forms of spirituality in the early um, 2000s in Spain, Italy, and, and mainly in Spain and Italy, uh, the, the people I encountered were, were felt that there was a, a risk speaking with me about their spirituality because they usually came from situations where they grew up in Catholic families and these Catholic families were very critical of their newfound spirituality. So uh, this approach allowed me to slowly bypass this feeling of risk that they had at the beginning during our encounters and uh, to allow them to, to speak more openly about how um, they had found their spirituality and also how their spirituality was related uh, to their criticism towards uh, religion, which was in most cases uh, Catholic religion, and also how this spirituality was related to he experiences of healing, especially related to um, issues of gender and sometimes uh, sexual abuse. Um, so um, what, I, what I found, and uh, these, these findings were mainly uh, discussed in a volume I co-edited with uh, Kim Knibbe, 
um, that is entitled Gender and Power in Contemporary Spirituality, um, is that when people say uh, I am uh, spiritual but um, not religious, um, we should not take this literally. I mean, not take for granted this, that these people actually have abandoned Catholic religion and are have now embraced a totally new form of spirituality. Uh, through the life stories, actually, you can, I discovered, and also other scholars who used other techniques uh, and who uh, wrote chapters in this book, found that the entanglement between spirituality and uh, religion is quite uh, complex and that uh, it is important to contextualize also in the local situation what is what people refer to when they speak about religion and what um, they say when they speak about spirituality. So, of course, in a place like Italy or Spain, when they speak about religion, for instance, they mainly refer to Catholic religion. In other places, this might be different. So what we proposed in this, in this uh, volume, Gender and Power in Contemporary Spirituality with Kim Knibbe was to consider spirituality and religion as two entities that are co-creating each other and exploring how this, um, how this happens. Um, in a follow-up uh, edited volume to this first, Gender and Power and Contemporary Spirituality, um, we, uh, Kim Knib and I, analyzed, uh, br brought a third element into this uh, analysis, so not only religion and spirituality, but also uh, secularity. So in this volume that is entitled Secular Societies, Spiritual Selves, we explored the interaction between religion, spirituality, and uh, secularity. Um, so um, th this is just to tell you briefly about my, 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 my background. The project that I would like to discuss briefly here is a, a very recent project. It is still going on. It, it, it is about religion, spirituality, and environmental sustainability in South Tyrol, Italy. Uh, so just to situate you very briefly, South Tyrol is a small uh, province in the Italian Alps that used to belong to Austria before the First World War. So they speak German there and the situation is a bit different from the rest of Italy, as you can uh, imagine. Um, uh, roughly 75% of the, the population is uh, still nominally uh, Catholic, but there, there exists little data about the religious diversity in South Tyrol. Um, so um, what, what I'm interested in, in is to, uh, we decided that since this project was only one year, we would focus mainly on uh, Catholic religion and on alternative spirituality and leave aside the other uh, religions. And um, what, what, what I found is that here in South Tyrol, alternative spirituality is not very present or at least not very visible in the public scene. Um, and so I, I, I decided to, um, to make uh, life story interviews with environmental activists to see if in, with this technique, again, I could find a, more about their spirituality. And uh, what actually I'm, I'm, I'm finding is that although these um, environmental activists are uh, have a catholic background they don't consider themselves usually as real, as uh, catholic as practicing catholics nor as um, religious in fact and they they tend to present themselves as being very secular and they have a very scientific discourse when talking about the environment um and Differently from the sort of eco-spiritual movements I, I, I knew in, in Spain and in Portugal and in Italy that are very critical of Catholic religion, uh, actually these uh, environmental activists um, are confident that the, that the Catholic Church can do a lot to help improve environmental awareness. So this was the first finding that uh, struck me because usually um, what I heard from, especially from eco-spiritual um, informants, but also from other 
um, non-religious environmental activists in, in Portugal, for instance, was that they were very critical of the anthropocentrism that is, that is typical of uh, Catholic uh, religion no? and other monotheistic religions. Uh, the other thing is that I'm, I'm, I'm finding that um, although they say they are not spiritual in the beginning, when, when you then start speaking with them, um, you, you discover that they have some certain ritual practices they do in nature and they help them to, um, to, to connect with nature or when they are in nature, they kind of, they have, uh, they describe feelings of uh, Eve, no? In German, you say Erfurt. It's sort of really, mm, yes, Eve that, that is very spiritually connotated. And, um, and they also say that these feelings of, in nature, they feel that there is something more uh, than the material reality are what keeps them going now. This, this, these feelings help them not to lose the, the hope and, uh, and to feel that they can still go on even if the situation here in, in South Tyrol is, is very difficult because it's a very touristic area. They keep building hotels and uh, they keep destroying woods and so on. And even if activism is going on, uh, the results are not really in, in sight, no? So um, I think that in this sense, what I found is that spirituality, but this sort of very uh, kind of private and, uh, and the spirituality related to the environment is helping uh, environmental activists to cope with also this ecological anxiety and with all the difficulties that they are, they are, they are finding. Um, however, I'm still continuing with these interviews. So uh, these are just preliminary findings and it, it, my hope is to discuss these findings with, uh, with you. And uh, what, what I think is, is, um, is, is, is also interesting is that we should, uh, we, we tend to, I don't know, but the little attention has been paid to this sort of of hidden spirituality, no? Uh, I mean, uh, there is a lot of research about spiritual movements, but what about this, this, this uh, sort of, I would call it hidden spirituality related to the environment that comes out only if you really dig deeper and speak with these um, environmentalists, no? Um, in this sense, my findings echo a bit what other researchers like Sarah Pike um, have found now in her in her research for the for the wild, or also more recently Irene Becci in her uh, research project. Uh, what for me was really unsettling was this different combination. Now I was I was used to the fact that religion was perceived as a sort of especially Catholic religion as an antagonist to environmentalism, whereas this is here is, is not the case. Also, what is very interesting is that usually the, the spiritual practitioners I spoke with were not familiar, really familiar with Catholic religion. When you ask specific questions about Catholic religion and Catholic lived religion, they, they knew little about it. They had a sort of stereotyped vision of, of Catholic religion, whereas here, since uh, Catholic uh, religion and also the rituals are very strong and very present, they, they are very familiar with actually also the, the lived religion. And this is why they are confident that this, that actually if the Catholic Church would be more active in promoting environmentalism, this would uh, help a lot here in, 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 in South Tyrol. Um, the, the, the other aspect I think that maybe is, is a bit, is, that I found is, is new in my research is this uh, commitment to keeping a secular discourse when talking about the environment. I was used to a very passionate way of talking about the environment and about the, the relationship with the environment, whereas the experience with these um, environmental activists is that they, they kind of try to stick to a very, very sober, secular, scientific discourse, no? And that they perceive that using a spiritual language or even a more emotional language would be 
uh, dangerous, risky because it's um, it's something that uh, that is not as irrational now, and so they would not be taken seriously. Um, and in general, I think that this this triangle between um, secularity, religion, and spirituality, um, especially in also keeping in mind gender is very useful to, to think also about the topics of well-being and risk that are at the center of this um, of this symposium uh, today. And um, even when sometimes, like in this latest uh, research uh, situation that I have described, the results are, are a bit puzzling. So I, I really look forward to discussing these issues and to receiving feedback from you in, in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, it's always good to hear something about um, Catholicism because mostly we hear a lot about Protestantism and the Europe, North European settings and in other places as well. So it's really good to get something from the south of Italy and um, where you are. So really interesting. Um, and the relationship with the environment, which is so topical nowadays, and it would be great to get questions and discussion about that um, religion and, and the environment and environmentalism. <clears throat> so um, our Next speaker is Francois Gauthier, who is Professor of Religious Studies at the Social Sciences Department at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland, um, and presently fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Nantes in France. Um, and um, yes, um, thank you, Francois, and the floor is yours now. Thank um, you. <clears throat> Thank you, Christina. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. You're going to have to look at me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Anna Halifoff uh, for uh, for inviting me. Um, it's it's been great to to be keeping in touch with Anna and her work, uh, which I really appreciated. And I'm really honored to be part of the people that you guys are thinking about when you're thinking about. Uh, putting up a network of uh, research on spirituality because my my field work does revolve around uh, that kind of uh, religious form, uh, even though I, I, I do a lot of armchair sociology. Um, so thank you, Anna. Thank you, Christina. Uh, it's a pleasure to 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 have you uh, to have you uh, chair this panel and to and to meet you more. Um, so I'm going to take a little step back with respect to the issues at stake. Um, so the aim of my talk is to question the fact that alternative or holistic spiritualities or self-spiritualities or, or whatever you want to call them, I call them, um, I, I inscribe them within the larger neo-nebula. I don't know if it's going to, this appellation is going to stick, but anyway. Um, all of these things are, are almost always discussed within a uh, Western framework as a Western phenomenon. Um, it, it's the case this morning. Um, this leads to a certain ethnocentrism or the risk of ethnocentrism in our analyses, um, albeit mostly an implicit manner. Um, most salient uh, is an embedded form of evolutionism. Uh, spirituality is a specifically Western phenomenon and therefore typical of advanced societies. Um, this summons the image of the West on the spearhead of the arrow of time, or simply just Western exceptionalism. So no one would say this as bluntly, certainly not people here in this panel, but it has impacts, uh, I argue, on how we name, label, categorize, understand, and analyze these phenomena. So namely, and I will come back to this in the third part of my paper, when we talk about secular spiritualities. So my talk has three parts. This is the first. Um, I'm going to try to set spiritualities as a global phenomenon. Um, in this sense, therefore, with respect to this Western centeredness, uh, a sidestep is useful to consider what's what's been happening, meanwhile, elsewhere in the world. Um, this shows how the rise of what we call spirituality is a global phenomenon. Um, some of the most significant work in this sense is that of René de la Torre, uh, who you've invited, and Christina Gutierrez. Both of them have been doing extraordinary work 
in the case of Latin America. What they clearly show in a bunch of, uh, of publications, Spanish, but also in English, is how New Age-related spirituality, including neo-paganism, neo-shamanism, neo-Indianism, is autochthonous to Latin America, as well as linked to transnational exchanges. However, it's, it's interesting to look at places that don't have a strong and persisting a colonial tie with Europe and the West. Uh, in the space of this paper, I'll have to be very brief on each little capsule, but I think it's enough to get the drift. Uh, Indonesia first. Um, Australian anthropologist Julia Day Howell, whom some of you probably know, her impressive work on Indonesia provides some valuable insights. She shows how Islam has shifted since the 1980s away from rationalized forms towards more personalized and experiential ones, including the remarkable comeback of formerly repressed Sufism, Islam's mystical branch, in both popular and middle-class forms. Among the latter, what we witness is a significant spiritualization of Islam in the service of personal realization. This phenomenon stretches out to include a current that is more distant with respect to Islam and has adopted the Western term spirituality or spiritualitas, uh, in Indonesian to designate a nebula of practices and sources that include, in the case of Indonesia, we find Reiki, yoga, Qigong, what Howell calls repackaged Asian spiritualities, emotional intelligence, logotherapy, Celestine prophecy workbooks and, and workshops, and, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So pretty much the same kind of mix that we have uh, uh, in, uh, in the West. In the context of Muslim-majority Indonesia, the adepts of these brands of spiritualities do not self-identify as spiritual, not religious, but, quoting Howell, the better educated middle classes have found terms like spiritual or spirituil useful in designating a sphere of personal development outside the arena of instrumental reality, unquote, I add, on the one hand, and sober scripturalism or dry ritualism on the other. Powell concludes by writing that, quote, the contrast between New Age seekers and Asia's new middle class seekers may not be so sharp after all. I now turn to China, on which I spent quite some time uh, reading over the last couple of years. Um, there would be so, so much to say here. I'll have to limit myself to the case of new Chinese metropolises in a nutshell, of which the special economic zones like Shenzhen, uh, constitute the most extreme examples. Uh, Shenzhen has grown, imagine that, from 80,000 in 1980 inhabitants to 13 million, with an average economic growth rate of 25%. That's to say that everybody living in Shenzhen, in this ultra-modern megacity which is facing Hong Kong, is therefore essentially unrooted from her or his place of origin. One could imagine that if there was one place in China that was preserved as a haven of rationality, sound utilitarianism, and secularism inherited from the communist era, it would be there. According to Fan and Whitehead, two anthropologists, however, this is far from being the case. Um, Fan and Whitehead's work, and especially Fan Li Chu, um, their work plunges into a spiritually thirsty Shenzhen. The five recognized religions are present, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, Protestant, Catholic, Christianity, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and their new and refurbished worship sites are, are relatively well frequented, but but that's not the main thing going on. And uh, a, a bunch, you know, massive, pretty much every other anthropologist working on different areas in China will tell you exactly the same thing. Um, I'm quoting them. Evidence from Shenzhen reveals another often overlooked dynamic of Chinese modernization. One of the most significant and surprising developments has been the extent to which the urbanized Chinese in Shenzhen adopt and adapt elements of their common spiritual heritage as part of an intentional spiritual search." Unquote. The extreme modernization of Shenzhen has catalyzed the emergence among its constituents of, quote, new questions of meaning and purposes, unquote. Yet rather than turning to the approved religious institutions, urbanites give, quote, very personal expression to their spiritual search in the age-old idiom of China's common spiritual heritage, unquote. It means going back to uh, a, a Chinese traditional religion, but in a completely re-spiritualized way. 
The need for a return to fundamentals that's provoked by the disruption of market-led globalization finds a personalized and spiritualized solution in urban areas, especially for the middle and upper classes. You can imagine that migrant workers are too busy surviving and working to engage in such introspection, but they are involved in more uh, heated uh, Hong Huo is the, the Chinese term, so heated effervescent sociality. That stuff is, is booming all over China. In other words, Chinese metropolises are home to a massive rise in spiritual, not religious, religiosities whose basic structures and dynamics are akin to what is experienced in the West. I could go on, extracting examples from the Muslim Middle East, uh, where a spiritualized brand of Islam has is spread massively. Um, President um, co-editing a handbook on Islam and consumer culture with, uh, with Islamic law specialist uh, Birgit Kravitz, um, in which another Islamic studies scholar, Lorenz Nixt, shows that the cultural meaning of baraka, so the grace in Islam, has changed over the last three decades significantly from what it was prior and was relatively stable. Traditional meaning being something like being well or living well. Two, guess what? Well-being in the self-help term, self -help term uh, uh, meaning. I could also scan more post-communist examples. For example, Eastern Europe, where there is a very neat correlation, very direct correlation between integration within global flows, EU integration, and the spread of yoga and meditation practice. So second part of my, uh, of my talk, spiritualities as the product of the lifestyleization of religion. So what this quick overview tells us, as I've said earlier, is that the rise of spiritualities is global first. But second, it also tells us that this rise is structural to our contemporary globalized societies. It's contextual, to be precise, to the last wave of economic and cultural globalization. I could show you, if I had time, how all of the regions I've mentioned have been impacted by the neoliberal revolution and how consumerism has penetrated and disseminated throughout their social fabric and culture. This is what I was personally extraordinarily surprised to learn by investigating the cases of China and Indonesia, among others, but also places as remote to global flows as we imagine them, Kazakhstan, Yemen, Mali, Bulgaria. Charles Taylor, as you all know by now, at least in, in our circles, uh, argued powerfully that the consumer culture in the West acted as a remarkable catalyst for the dissemination of an expressive type of individualism and its connected ethics of authenticity. And as you know, these ethics mean that the goal and meaning of life becomes to find and to realize the unique and undetermined self that we believe we have and to express it publicly in order to be recognized and validated in our identity. Uh, social classes have become diffracted as a consequence, uh, not only in the West, into what Quebec sociologist Jacques Beauchemin calls a society of ad identities. It's also a society in which identity takes the form of a lifestyle an aesthetic compound that comprises fashions, tastes, how we behave, what we eat, and so on. This has manifold effects, including the widespread lifestyleization of society and culture. In turn, religion is both affected by, and which I've also learned uh, through this research, also a vector for uh, lifestyleization. The most obvious effects are, uh, one, the new visibility of religion at the private, public level, but also in geopolitics, so all across the board, and two, a blurring of the boundaries between the neatly differentiated social spheres that were institutionalized in the prior nation-state bound regime of modernity. This includes the boundaries between religion and entertainment, economics, politics, psychology, tourism, and so on. Um, in some, it's the boundaries between religion and the secular. Uh, it also includes the private and public divide on which the modes of state regulation of religion and Western secularism are uh, founded. In a nutshell, the consequences are extremely important and should lead us to seriously rethink our conceptual tools to think about religion and therefore spirituality or spiritualities. I was struck to find how profoundly expressive individualism has penetrated the social fabric of a place like China after millennia of filial piety and imperial culture, and then decades of radical communism. Yet expressive individualism has changed every indicator to an astonishing extent 
over the course of only four decades of economic liberalization. Romantic love, marriages, divorce, sex, dating, the rapports between generations, family, work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This leads me to another question. If the rise of what we can call spirituality is global and structural to life under global market conditions, it, is it the only religious phenomenon that is so? The answer is no. There are a few. Uh, but I will focus on one here, which I think needs to be directly correlated with the rise of expressive individualism and lifestyleization and therefore spiritualities. I'm talking about the charismatic brands of religion of the Pentecostal type, whose worldwide expansion is dizzying and is completely changing the landscape and the dynamics on the ground. Uh, again, if we look at China, things are very instructive. Pentecostalism is booming in China, big time. Yet research shows that it booms in the regions where, get this, Chinese traditional religion and local traditions have been the most eradicated, as well as in the cities. What we find in regions where detraditionalization has been less radical, however, are other charismatic forms of religion, including linked to you know, Confucianism, Tao, uh, Buddhism, uh, mix of all that, but also popular religion renewals, that ally that, that people like Feng and Yang don't talk about, uh, that ally experiential religiosity, charismatic leaders, and entrepreneurial ethic, moral and political conservatism, and prosperity theologies. There's no time, but I could summon examples from Indonesia across the Muslim world to show how these trends exist there as well, without there being Pentecostalism per se. So what do I make of this in the light of the theme of our, of, our, of our conference, spirituality, well-being, and risk. I make that spiritualities and Pentecostalism form a system, that they are variegated, opposed, and structural responses to the present brand of global capitalism, that they are two ways to surf the incessant tides of change and imperatives of today's global societies, that they are instituted ways of negotiating what Ulrich Beck calls risk society. You see, I'm, talk, I'm taking risk at, at the more kind of the, the macro level. Um, the tropes of well-being, health, life balance, re self-realization, material and relational success, and healing, which, which are common to spiritualities and Pentecostal type religion, albeit in different ways, all of this makes sense from this perspective. Other phenomena can also be tied to these macro level factors that are more protective reactions against these tides, these risks. It's the case for, and, 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 um, um, and, and we heard about that, uh, the, the, that being questioned earlier, the, the rise of authoritarian and neo-nationalist tendencies across the world, often bulwarked by religious references, and which all attempt to go back to what? To the foundations of the prior world, strong state, and a nation that is uh, uh, safe, unifying, in a container. But Pentecostalism type religion shares with spiritualities a grounding in expressive individualism and lifestyle. Galen Watts, if he's still there, hey, Galen. Um, Galen Watts in his book, The Spiritual Turn, brilliantly showed how charismatic Christianity in the West is an expression of expressive individualism, lifestyleization, and what he calls the religion of the heart. Yet if we seek to deconstruct Western exceptionalism, it becomes clear that this thesis also rings true in a much more global fashion. That is with all due respect for local variations, of course. This brings me back to my uh, third and last point, or last section, which is open-ended. How do we name all of this? How can we conceptualize spiritualities when we've shaken our mostly implicit assumptions about Western specificity and Western exceptionalism? What if we look at spirituality from China? We can recognize to start with that the concepts in the sociology of religion are bound to a very particular, and, and religious studies, a very particular brand of religion at a very particular time in Western history, post-Reformation, Christianity, parochial religion. And that this model of religion is intimately tied to the rise of the post-Westphalian modern nation state. Following Peter Beyer, I like to call this type of religion churched religion. I think it really sounds good and you really see what it means. Again, a stroll around the world, I don't have time, but it would show how this church model of religion was actually imported and enforced pretty much everywhere with extraordinary consequences for religion and every other social dimension. China is an amazing case. 
This is certainly true for so China, Indonesia, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe, on which I spent you know the last couple of years working on. Uh, church religion is strictly differentiated, instituted, nationally contained, state regulated, belief based. It's got super rituals. It's scriptural. It has exclusive belonging. It's theistic, and so on. These characteristics to to so name and think of religion became embedded in, in what I call following Jose Casanova, the secularization paradigm, which is much wider than secularization theories per se. You can actually put rational choice in there easily. Following this, there are two ways to understand spirituality. The first, the mainstream way, remains embedded in the assumption of the secularization paradigm in which church religion remains the standard. This position sees spiritualities as a step towards the fragmentation of religion or something, we're not too sure, or more or less explicitly as a step along the road to fulfilled secularization for the most hopeful. Uh, a handy way out for those who don't want to commit as much is to overstate the fuzzy qualifiers. The notion of secular spirituality is the staple of this mainstream approach. The alternative is to see church religion as a contextual rather than fixed and natural form of religion and to understand spiritualities, but also the other new forms of religion like Pentecostalism. I think we've un understated the, 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 what the, the rise of Pentecostalism and charismatic Christianity means for wider Christianity. Uh, it's certainly not Protestant, Pro Protestantism in my, in my, in my view. So um, the alternative therefore is to see uh, this rise as a product of a profound religious change, a qualitative change for which church religion cannot be preserved as the analytical standard. This is, I believe, what Linda uh, Woodhead thinks. Uh, I totally share uh, this diagnosis with her. This is also what Galen Watts uh, uh, sustains. So indeed, if the religion secular couple is a construct that is linked to the rise of the nation state, not to mention derived from a Christian theology, if the neoliberal revolution and overarching marketization and globalization processes have challenged these arrangements in a way that erodes the very substance of the religion secular uh, divide and the private public divide, the very concept of the secular becomes highly problematic and in particular speaking about spirituality. To finish, my hopes are, are that the SWELL project, and as well as the brilliant network of scholars uh, it, it has assembled for, for this conference and for future work um, in the study of spiritualities, will, will take the full measure of what this object of study encourages us to do with respect to our inherited and dated concepts. Thanks. Thank you, Francois. There was a lot of um, thought, um, thing for thought, um, food for thought. Um, and I'm very appreciative of you, including the rest of the globe, um, not just the West separated from the West, but the globe um, as a whole, as I've done a lot of research on transnational religion and religion and the spiritualities of the global South and how the global North relates to that. So that was, was very good. And on Pentecostalism, mega churches like Hillsong. So I will ask, we are now, thank you everyone for keeping to the time. That was brilliant. I didn't have to hit anybody on the head and ask.